here, the goal is to kind of, hopefully by the end of this hour, to uh, have a little better sense of these words and how they fit together. Um, so I'm going to be talking about things that Daniel talked about uh, just a little bit ago, which is the ground states of local Hamiltonians and uh, understanding them. Uh, and yeah, they advertised the bait and switch was that, uh, well, it's not really a bait and switch. So there's a one, d uh, talk a little bit about 1D area laws and also a recent algorithm for finding ground states of 1D syst gap systems. Um, and I guess maybe it's worth pointing out uh, that at least for me, the notion of an uh, AGSP, an approximate ground state projection, is sort of emerging as kind of a really exciting new tool for sort of looking at these things. So, um, all right, so let's sort of start somewhere. So here, here, the basic difficulty of understanding many body physics is, is just a matter of scale. You've got a bunch of particles together, and um, each particle sort of is modeled as a d-dimensional space. But if you want to understand how the system works together, you end up having to, for n particles, you have to tensor those spaces together. Right? They're interactions, you have to tensor them together. And so what are you talking about now? You're talking about a d to the n dimensional space, an exponential size space. Right? Um, and so that's a pretty large thing to be thinking about. Um, um, and what do we end up wanting to know is sort of the state of the system, and the state of the system ends up being a vector in this exponentially large space. And so we've kind of got this double-edged sword, right? So the reason computation, quantum computation, you know, the basis for it being powerful is the fact that it works on an exponentially large space. But that also is, makes understanding many bodies of physics really difficult because we're working on an exponentially large space and how do you get a hold of that? And in particular, right, even giving a description of a state, right, requires, an ex unless you have some clever way of doing it, requires exponential amount of information. So this seems, this is sort of the basic sort of difficulty that you're always trying to navigate around is sort of how do you do any sort of physics or computation under, under these circumstances. Right. And so, well, how do you sort of explain a way that maybe you can do something is, well, you've got all these, you know, you've got all states. We said that's really, really big. But maybe sort of you can find a little corner with sort of the relevant, a set of relevant states for what you're looking for. Right. Maybe you can find a corner <laughs> where you can really sort of do some analysis. And what kind of analysis would you want to do? What kind of understanding would you want? What kinds of questions would you want to ask? Well, you want to ask, well, in these sort of physically relevant states of some sort, do they have any special structure? And can I exploit that structure in some way? So first, even just understanding that it has a special structure sort of constitutes understanding. But um, So for one thing, can we describe them in some reasonable way? And can we describe them in a reasonable way in a way so that we can compute with them? So again, is this all, these are all questions around sort of taking something that's inherently exponential in nature and sort of reducing it down to something. So. All right, so what are the states that we're talking about? Well, the states we're going to talk about are ground states of local Hamiltonians. And I've sort of benefited from the fact that Umesh has sort of brought up this and Daniel has brought up this stuff. So this is your third time through if you've been here for two days. Um, so hopefully... This will sound sort of strangely and relaxingly familiar. Um, OK, so what, what, what is the sort of setup? And we're going to be talking about, in this case, we're going to sort of picture particles on a lattice, a two-dimensional lattice. Right? And so they're sitting there. And what do we have to sort of form a local Hamiltonian? We have the notion of a local term. Right? And so what does a local term mean? Well, it's a operator, a linear operator, self adjoint, right? and it's uh, these two particles constitute a small, the tensor product of these two spaces is a small space. Right? And we're going to think of HI as an operator that acts on that small space in some interesting way, and then acts on the rest of the space as a tensor product with the identity. Okay? So this is a local term. So it's locally, it's acting, does something interesting there, and tensored with the identity everywhere else. That's the notion of a local term. And as sort of was discussed by Daniel, so, so in, in general, people, well, or maybe computer scientists, as we sort of discovered, uh, 
when they say local, they don't necessarily mean geometrically local. They just mean a small number of terms in their interaction. But we're really going to focus on geometrically local. So there's going to be a notion of some geometry of the particles. And now local means you only act on a few of them. And they're near each other. Um, and I, uh, it turns out that this is just as good, acting on two of them is just as good, because you can, if you have something that's acting on, let's say, no more than k, you can kind of break up your space into bigger chunks, group, group instead of one particle, sort of group a bunch of particles together, call that a single mega system, um, and realize these local terms in this way. So this is, this is the setup. And what is a local, so this is a local term of a, of a Hamiltonian. What's a, Hamil, a local Hamiltonian itself? It's a, an operator itself, and it's a sum of local operators. Right? So here we've got um, an edge for each, each, a, each, each one of these edges represents an interaction, a local term that's acting non-trivially on, let's say, these two particles and trivially everywhere else. We sum this thing up, we get an operator on the whole space. Right? And what are we interested in this case? We're interested in what's called the ground state, which is the lowest, the smallest eigenvector of H. Sort of, we've, there's been some discussion about understanding this is somehow understanding something about uh, physical models at, at low temperature, sort of getting a sense of what this ground state looks like. And there's some. Um, OK, there's was sort of a relevant quantity that keeps coming up. And so let's just make sure we say it at the outset, is the gap. Um, and what is the gap? It's so, so this local Hamiltonian, let's just imagine ordering its eigenvectors with multiplicity. Sorry, its eigenvalues. I always do this. Um, its eigenvalues with multiplicity from smallest to biggest. So the smallest one is the ground state. And the gap refers to the distance between the smallest and the next smallest. So in particular, if we talk about something that has a gap, we aren't talking about a system, at least for the purposes of this talk, we're not talking about a system where there's the lowest, uh, there are multiple um, eigenvectors for the smallest eigenvalue. Right? So we're sort of picturing a unique smallest eigenvalue vector and then a gap. And by a gap, we talk about that distance. And, usually, and when we say gapped Hamiltonians, we mean that distance is a constant. And I guess I should have said somewhere along the lines, which I didn't write down anywhere, that um, these local terms, these hi, are thought to be of operator norm a constant, order one. And in fact, you can think about them if you just want to do it, and it's not particularly damaging to think about hi as just projections. Right? So you can think about each of these little interactions as picking out some subspace of this, the tensor product of these two spaces as being, and penalizing things that aren't living in that subspace. In a unit. OK, so then the, when we, the interesting sort of in terms of gap, this is the distance between the lowest and the, and, and the second lowest. And uh, just to get a sense of scale, right, the norm of this, of h, in this particular case, is on the order of n squared. Each of the, they're n squared terms. Each of them are of order one. You expect the norm to be around on order n squared. And we, we end up talking a lot about something that has constant gap. So it's constant relative to this n squared. OK, so this is just what I said, that we're going to focus on unique ground state with constant gap. And that the physical, just the, the physical relevance of this I've already sort of mentioned. Okay. So, OK, so, okay so, so quantum Hamiltonian complexity, which this is a whole semester on, right, has those words, quantum Hamiltonian complexity. So let me just talk about this, the strong link, that which Umesh also talked about, between <laughs> Uh, ground states of local Hamiltonians, which is a physically motivated question, and, and constraint satisfaction problems, which existed separately as um, the word of complexity theory. So here's, um, you know, 3SAT is, or SAT, SAT, SAT is something that people, it's sort of the standard bearer for uh, constraint satisfaction problems. But I'm just going to sort of, just to give you a sense, I'm just going to give you a different one. And so in this case, I'm going to talk about 3 colorability because it gives you the, It'll be good for the geometry of, of, of the connection. So here's the question. I give you a map. Right? Here's a map. And I say, look, I, I, wanna, I want you to sort of uh, 
make a nice presentation of this map. I want you to color this map. Unfortunately, colors cost something, so we only have three colors that we can use, and I want this map to really shine in the presentation that whatever we're giving. So I'm going to ask you to color this map in three different colors in such a way that two neighboring countries aren't the same color so that they don't blend one to the other. Right? So this is, this is the question of um, can I color this map with three colors? Right? So one way to sort of attack this problem or analyze this problem is say, OK, well, I'm going to put a vertex right, for each region. And I'm going to assign, so that vertex will be assigned a color. Right? And what is it that I want to do is I want to make sure that neighboring uh, countries don't have the same color. So I'm going to throw in an edge for every neighboring countries. Let me get a picture like that. And that edge is going to say, hey, let's just make sure that if you are on two ends of an edge, they're not labeled by the same color. So I can now remove the actual map. Sort of now I have a graph. And so what do I have a graph? I have a graph where each of the nodes of the graph represents the possible colors. And the edges represent what's called a constraint. And in this particular case, the constraint insists that uh, what you label one edge, well, one end of one edge is different from what you label the other end. And then you're interested in uh, finding an assignment of all the blue dots right, such that all the constraints are satisfied. And more generally, you might ask the question of what's the minimal number of constraints that I have to, you know, maybe there isn't an assignment for all, but what's the minimal minimum that I have to violate? Okay. So that's the classical, that's, that's a three colorability, and I think if you Ask three colorability for, I think, for planar graphs that are four valent at least, or I mean, degree bound, even degree bounded by four, this becomes a, uh, an MP problem. Um, and so, you know, in complexity theory, you're solving, classifying, and understanding these things. Um, and more general constraint satisfaction problems um, is sort of, that's where it's at. So, all right, so this already, I mean, I've sort of set this up so that this has some similar flavor to to local Hamiltonians, but the flavor is, it's not only a flavor, it's really sort of a precise um, generalization, so let's sort of go through that. Right? So, so the heart of the matter is that the uh, local Hamiltonians are going to turn out to be a non-commutative generalization of constraint satisfaction problems. So let's sort of just explicitly make that clear, right? So now let's go back to our local Hamiltonian sort of picture of really a, a, um, the particles aligned on a, on a 2D grid, right. and so let's so each particle, right? So the particle in the in the three colorable problem or the colorable problem was um, sort of in what did the particle the information that it contained is a possible different number of colors, right? and in the in the local Hamiltonian setting, it's the dimension of a single particle, right? or if we had clustered them together, a group of particles. it's the local dimension of the local space, and the local term was in both cases was a local constraint and here is here is where the generalization occurs right? if you think if you start to think about constraint satisfaction problems in this way what you realize about what this constraint looks like is that it's diagonal and if you're really talking about constraints of violating a constraint and not violating a constraint it's just picking out it's on the diagonal and it puts a one for any for any labeling of the of these guys for which the constraint is violated, and it puts a zero along the diagonal corresponding to for any ones that it's, that it's satisfied. And so it's diagonal. I, by diagonal, I mean in the standard basis of the natural basis of this problem, this is diagonal. Whereas for the local Hamiltonian terms, these can be arbitrary in the sense, arbitrary, but um, I, I already said you could sort of have it, you could think about it pretty simply as just a, some projection but not a projection that's diagonal necessarily. Okay, so this is the sense in which uh, this is a non-commutative generalization because these constraints, they all commute one to another, right? Whereas these constraints don't. Okay, and so now let's just sort of continue just the, the correspondence, right? <coughs> if I've set this up in this way, right? The assignment that violates the fewest constraints corresponds exactly to the ground state or the lowest eigenvalue. Because the assignment that violates the fewest constraint will be the lowest eigen, uh, eigenvector of this, of this problem. And the lowest eigenvalue will be the least number of constraints violated 
And whereas in this case, the lowest eigenvalue will be the minimal energy, the, the energy that the ground state has. They're much stronger than the constraint imposing diagonal term. <coughs> so, so, so ask, what is what is not clear, or what is clear? What do you? Uh, uh, the, this mapping that the constraint satisfying solution is the lowest eigenvalue state when you have the non-commuting, the, the the local term. Right. So, okay. So, I, I'm. I think this might be just a semantical thing. But what I'm what I'm saying is you you know once you have this correspondence the first two correspondences you can think of this problem as an example of this problem where the cons oh, I see. right yeah. and then as such when we start talking about ground states what does that mean in the language of this it's the assignment that violates the fewest constraints which was exactly the thing of interest that we had in the classical setting or another thing of interest was the least number of constraints violated. Maybe you don't want to know the assignment, you just want to know whether it's doable or not. Right? And the least number of constraints corresponds to the lowest eigenvalue. So that, that these things that we were interested in for physical reasons turn out to be the exact same things that we would be interested in from a computer science perspective. You're saying actually we discussed that, right? Maybe it's a better question to say that. So when you say in particular when they all commute, so there is a difference if they commute and they are diagonal. Or no, so uh, they yeah, so let's. And they are commute and they are not diagonal. Yeah, so let's, and that'll actually come up later. So let me say that one difference between this and this is that these guys commute, these guys don't have to commute. There's, but there are certainly examples that aren't diagonal where they all commute. They're just in a different, they're in a different basis. So it's not the case that if I take this, the, the local Hamiltonian problem, and I ask for all the constraints to commute, that they, that means that there is a there is an example. It's, 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 it's that they have to be diagonal in the standard basis, which as a consequence means they commute, but it's just an example. One more, I think, interesting point is that classically, the two bottom uh, approaches are equivalent. I mean, if you know the, the just the, the number of, uh, if you can solve the, the how, uh, it, whether there exists something that satisfies all the solution can help you find the solution uh, using some polynomial reduction for most interesting problems. Uh, but it, it should be noted that, that we don't know the same thing for, for in the quantum case, and somehow this is usually not uh, spelled out. You see, you see my... Uh, yeah, so, so what you, so... If you, if you know to find the, the lowest eigenvalue, that's, I don't know of any way to help you to find the ground state. Suppose I give you an oracle that helps you find the lowest eigenvalue. Can you construct the, uh, uh, the ground no, but state? but what are you saying <coughs> classically that's classically true? you can do that. If you can find, uh, if you know that there is an assignment, you can you know, tweak your problem in, in certain ways, and then it will help you to find... Uh, Always? It's the decision to search reduction. That if you don't have so many decisions, maybe it's for Kozirani or something. I don't know. I don't know. I, I tried. I never succeeded. I don't know. Yeah, I understand. Same problem. I'm not sure it's across those clears. It was clear to me, though I did. But, but uh, uh, somebody asked something if, if it wasn't. It's worth pursuing offline. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Great. Oh, and I, I guess I should say for, for um, I, I guess I should say in general, for, for, for people who, there, there was a sort of a year ago, there was a kind of a pre-conference for this sort of thing. And um, um, one of the consequences of that was some talks didn't get passed about their second slide because everybody asked questions and there was a lot of things like that. And, and I th it's de definitely my opinion, and I think it was shared by a bunch of other people, that that was one of the best conferences we had ever been to. And so in, in that spirit, please, I challenge you to prevent me from getting through my slides. So. Um, OK, so all right, so we've set up this, this, uh, this uh, correspondence. So now we're going to sort of, we sort of took this little detour to sort of go through the classical world to understand this correspondence. Let's go back to this. Uh, question of understanding the ground states, right? And so what, now we are sort of solid in the idea of what a ground state is, and so I'm just going to remind you of these questions that sort of are sitting out there, right? 
right? Do they have special structure? Does the structure allow for short, meaningful descriptions? And um, can you work with them, these descriptions? I mean, there is, you know, a priori, there is a short, <laughs> meaningful description. I give you the Hamiltonian. That's a meaningful description. I say, you know, it's the ground state of this thing. But, you know, right, so that's a short, meaningful description, but it doesn't allow you to work with it. Okay, and so the spoiler to the thing is that for gapped 1D systems, gapped meaning constant gap, the answer is yes. And for higher dimensions, the answer is don't know. Seth, could you specify what you mean by constant gap? I think it's been discussed, but I... Okay, so constant, so we, uh, let's assume all the local terms are of order operator norm one. So the actual Hamiltonian could be, if it was on a 2D grid, could have a norm up to like, let's say, n squared. Right? But the constant gap we're talking about is a, a fixed constant independent of n. And by gap, we mean the difference between, the distance between the lowest and second lowest. And, you know, if, if you were to ask me what an ambitious but exciting goal for, for, for the semester would be, would be to make some progress on this higher dimensional stuff. And there's reasons to think that now is the time to do that, um, which hopefully by the end of the talk you'll have some sense of. Um, okay, so let's try to understand. So this is. So I should say that you know I come from a math background, so my um, I'm excited about this um, particular thing for a lot of reasons. But one is because I want to understand physics intuition um, and to some extent CS intuition about some, a lot of these things. Um, so I'm going to give you a particular point of view of this, uh, this journey of understanding ground states and I sort of with the caveat that this is, this is from a particular perspective. Okay. Sorry, this may have already been answered yesterday. It, for, for the 1D gap system, can you verify that it is gapped? No. I mean, we don't know how to. You know, as uh, Daniel mentioned, uh, for 2D, verifying the gap is yeah. for two, for two. Here, here it may be the case that based on this algorithm, you, you might be able to actually make progress on actually verifying gaps. But, but there, are a lot of, there are a lot of pieces we've talked about which, uh, which are missing to make that happen. So that, that's actually another very interesting point. It really, it's an interesting question. I, I don't know whether I should echo. Um, okay, so this is something my dad, who's in math, sort of would tell me every once in a while, chuckling over breakfast or lunch or something. But in, in theory, there is no difference between theory and practice, but in practice there is, right? And so as I was sort of trying to sort of map out how, what I was going to say about sort of the story, I kind of felt like one of the themes going through it was that theory and practice sort of, there's sort of this evolution where theory and practice diverge and then they come together and they diverge again and they come together. So in preparation, I sort of tried to look up who this quote is due to. And it seems a little controversial in terms of different people have said to it. But one person who is definitely credited with having said this, who I was not expecting, was Yogi Berra. Um, who, I don't know how many of you know who he is, but he uh, was a wonderful catcher, baseball player and manager for the Yankees. Um, and he has um, the reputation of saying lots of things that uh, you kind of nod your head and say, even though it sounds ridiculous, it's kind of right. Uh, um, so he's, he's the one who said, it, it ain't over till it's over. Um, or he's also the one who said, uh, that restaurant's so popular, no one goes there anymore. Um, so he's kind of. Anyway, so anyway, so he's one of these. So anyway, perhaps not particularly relevant, but but. Uh, um, so again, so the question is, how do you you know how do you do physics within this exponentially sized space? And so here's what happens in when you do deep weight. Uh, introduce this idea of a density matrix renormalization group as an algorithm for finding ground states of one D systems. Um, and it sort of pivoted on, it's, uh, on the, um, the assumption that ground states should have a matrix product state representation. Um, and I'm not going to spend any time saying what that is, um, but, uh, but I can sort of promote it as a reason to come to the TensorNetwork uh, 
boot camp thing on Saturday. Anyway, it's it's a it's a, a matrix product state representation is sort of basically what we're kind of looking for, which is sort of a, a representation of a set of states that, for which you can do you can actually do calculations, um, and just sort of he said, well, the, you know, this was a model, and let's see what we can do with it. And the result was that it had remarkable success in one dimension. So it sort of really was, it, you know, and really is still considered to be the kind of gold standard for, for what you can do computationally. So is it approximation or is it precise? Like, can you express it exactly as a, <coughs> as a um, matrix product state or just approximately? So, so at, at, at the, the ground state. Yeah, so you're asking, should we flash forward to the present? Is that, is that, so, th so what's known is that n there's very good, arbitrarily good approximations with, with matrix product states with, uh, with uh, I guess, polynomial size uh, bond dimension on here. That's meaningful. But at the time, it was um, just sort of, let, let's try to see what, how, good a, how good a state we can find of this form. That minimizes the energy, and it turned out for. Um, I don't know the history all that well to say how, how it was determined that things were doing really well, but but in terms of precisely to say, hey, this is actually doing well, but but it has been very successful. <coughs> Somebody else had it. Historically, like the matrix product states came first in the AKLT model, where they made the model so that the matrix product states are exact solutions for with small uh -huh. dimension. So there are particular models where we know, but in general, when we solve these problems, mm -hmm. it's but approximately, you can always approximate it. So I'm and and I guess I should say that if you allow the bond dimension to grow, <laughs> you get everything. But that's then you're just dealing with an exponential amount of. Was there? Yeah. So can the algorithm be applied to two D? Can the can this yeah, algorithm be applied? Yeah. Um, in Theory, yeah, yeah, and it has been tried in various ways with uh, people not really particularly successful. It's, it's not, not that it's been tried, it's been used all the time. <laughs> <laughs> like really, you, you take a 2D lattice and then you pretend it's a chain, like this. <coughs> and that's what we do all the time. Um, so, so the algorithm itself is formulated only for 1D, yes. so you have to just form 2D to 1D. Yeah, so you, you oh. have to view the 2D system in 1D and with longer interactions, but so, so, so I suppose though there are there are uh, well-known cases that it doesn't work, so that become kind of benchmark uh, for people to test their 2D algorithm. It's just it's slow. It's it's slow, and you need like large because the coron imagine that you have a 2D system and you make a chain out of this. So this guy interacts with the guy from the next level. So to carry that information, you have you have to carry it all the way around. So then you need a really large dimension of the matrices. So large meaning non-polynomial. In practice, it means like thousands, millions, whatever. But is there <coughs> like a theoretical example where you can show that there is no matrix, like for 2D, there is no matrix product state for this particular uh, setting or for this particular Hamiltonian? So, can, so did one ever exhibit a Hamiltonian in 2D for which there is no matrix product state that approximates the ground state. I think you can just tensor up. So, you know, so one of the, okay, so maybe more of this should be done offline, but, but I think one thing to say is that if you model it by a matrix product state that's sort of weaving around, the bond, you know, the, the amount of <laughs> entanglement between two, let's say, layers, right, is sort of, is, is, is been shrunk to just this one bond, and so that bond has to get very, very large because you can create states that have lots of entanglement. So you you need to, to approximate. You need to know that that bond is large. You can just create a vertical set of L states easily, and then you So then, what you are saying is that the problem is actually is known not to be solvable. Uh, using a chain. Uh, using a chain like this. So what is the hope that maybe people are using something else than a chain or 
No, the hope is that, that for the system that you're working on, the entanglement is very, very is small enough so that this is so capturing what's going on. For special systems, so the hope is that for special systems. Well, all these algorithms are run on particular examples, right? So, and sorry, sorry, I think, I think uh, Mario, I, I think the example I'm saying where you have the Okay. Okay. So, so I think at the time um, this was sort of thought to be really something amazing, and uh, there's there's some real sense in which it was working without people necessarily. There were sort of heuristics involved. It was working. It was at, uh, over time. It was deemed that sometimes it didn't work, and more heuristics were put in place, and um, uh, but there was sort of some sense that there was a missing. There was sort of a lot of intuition, but there was a missing sort of grounded basis. And as Umesh likes to say, where you can do it in practice, but can you do it in theory? Right. So that's sort of right now. I would sort of say that right at that particular moment, there was sort of a dissonance between sort of what was a very surprising practical result, for which theory had no great explanation for. So let me sort of uh, fast forward to to ninety seven when um, Kataev sort of uh, introduced the notion of uh, QMA, the quantum analog of NP, um, and showed that finding the ground states of general quantum systems is QMA complete, which was sort of discussed a little bit before. And so that put some sort of theoretical fra framework on this idea that these guys are these in general not for 1D systems, but in general, this is a hard problem. Right? We shouldn't expect to have an algorithm that works. Okay, And slowly, slowly, um, people refined this argument. right? And so in 05, 06, it was, so these were general Hamil local Hamiltonians, not necessarily geometric, as we were talking about. But in 05 and 06, this became true of a 2D system, the 2D QMA. <coughs> and so at that point, there was sort of this sense in which, well, maybe we have some sense of what's going on. So um, 2D systems are hard. That makes sense, right? 1D systems, classically 1D system constraint satisfaction problems, those are solvable. Those are easy, right? And so maybe that's what's going on, right? The quantum world, the 1D systems are, are we've got an algorithm that seems to work sort of. So maybe it's just that they're, you know, in 1D, that's the, that's the, the geometric constraint of 1D is enough to make these things easy. And so we were all, everybody was happy until there was a result that said, actually, 1D systems are also hard. Right? So solving 1D systems are also hard. QMA hard. And so that sort of, again, brings in this distance, right? You've got this algorithm that does it. On the other hand, it's supposed to be hard. And it, 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 the algorithm does it in practice it, on particular examples, but it's supposed to be hard. And I, I guess as has been referred, it's sort of referenced, it's sort of maybe both in hindsight and maybe even at the time, um, but probably not, uh, that the, the notion of a gap here for the, the, hard, the hardness results have gaps that are smaller than constant. And so in hindsight, we can sort of say, OK, well, these are not the same problems. And especially in hindsight, when we know that ones with constant gap are solvable, we, we can sort of say, OK, that was, that was the thing. But at the time, that's all right, so simultaneous to this, we haven't sort of brought it up, but the biggest word on that original screen was area law. And so here, here's the time to introduce that. So an area law, what, um, so what is it? It's sort of a, it's kind of a, an idea of, the of what the structure of ground states should look like in, in some complexity formulation. And um, again, I'm not from the physics background, but it, uh, as far as I understand, it's sort of key, it, it sort of, there's a holographic principle in cosmology which says something about black holes and that the energy uh, is is sort of sort of displayed on the boundary is, is sort of lives on the boundary and, and and that translated to 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 sort of this general sort of idea which is that the complexity of the system of the quantum system should depend only on the size of the boundary and by the size of the boundary um, the idea was that there you've got these local interactions 
and how, you know, should depend on how many local interactions cross the boundary in terms of understanding the complexity of the system between the inside and the outside. And I'm being deliberately vague about what I mean by complexity, or sort of, because for now, you can just think of it vaguely like that. And so this, this notion, called an area law, which is not necessarily a law in the sense that no, it was an idea and, and a concept that people believed might be true, still do, um, but nothing had been proven, uh, was then um, formalized in some, in some way where complexity was formalized in terms of entanglement entropy, which, uh, let's see, we'll probably hear about this afternoon. Um, yeah, we should learn here. It's this afternoon, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the, yeah. So, so I'm not going to spend any time on entanglement entropy, but it's a sort of measure of the amount of complexity of the system across this boundary. Um, and and just that sort of those ideas kind of fueled, uh, sort of really did end up applying to DMRG. The sort of the ideas of thinking about it this way led to better sort of better heuristics, some speed up, some simplification, some better understanding of what was going on. Okay, so despite this fact, we're still at the stage where there, the area law is just a um, conjecture. So there's sort of no proofs of anything. So we could sort of, if, if continuing with this theory and practice thing, there's, um, there's no sort of, there wasn't, there wasn't quite resonance because theoretically we didn't, have any proofs for the area law, and that changed in, in 2007 when Matt Hastings uh, proved a 1D area law. Right? So let's just make sure we understand what it means, what we're saying in terms of, in my vague way that I'm saying it, which is that you've got a 1D system, right? and the amount of entanglement, for those of you who know what that means, that's fine. For those of you not, it's sort of the amount of cross-talking that occurs across this boundary in terms of describing the state, should be uh, just dependent on the amount of interactions across this boundary. And so in this case, despite the fact that there are maybe n particles and those particles, or you know, the number of particles in each side grow, the amount of entanglement should be, should be bounded by a constant. Right? Which sort of translates sort of to sort of the idea that even, <coughs> even though you can have a lot of particles way out here and way out here, really sort of all the talking is sort of local. That's the kind of general picture. Okay, and uh, Hastings is further than that. He, he, not only did he show that it established an area law, but he also showed that it did, these states did have good approximations that look like MPSs, interspotic states, right? So finally we've got some sort of thing. Okay, this idea that they should look like this, or they could look like this, let's model them to look like this. Well, that, that sort of verified that they could. Yeah. All right, and so that presented a picture, right? And so here was the picture, right? So you've got 1D so solutions. And you have a dividing line between those for which DMRG would work. You can sort of maybe say, loosely say they're easy, which is a misnomer, but they're sort of, we can get a handle on them. And that dividing line should be where the area law holds. Where the area law holds, we should maybe, these ideas should maybe work, and where they, where they don't. Okay, and so that was, that was great. Um, sort of gave us a sense of, you know, all is well again, right? until these guys came up with an example of, some, of a ground state that satisfied an area law, but for which finding it was NP-hard. Right? So he provides an example for which the area law holds, but for which DMRG, unless it was, DMRG was not going to work. Okay, so. Sorry, can you, can you clarify a little bit what the statement's supposed to be? So there are a lot of things that are NP hard that involve no entanglement at all. So what is this saying? Oh, so this is saying, right, so DMRG is sort of an algorithm, right, a, a, without any proofs that it works. Right? It was working on a lot of things. Right? Once the 1D area law came along and said, hey, look, you know, the assumptions you make on DMRG about the way things look is right. So it seems very reasonable that you could find them then. And here, this is, seems to be working. So uh, the picture is that in 1D solutions, we have a dichotomy between where the area law holds and where it doesn't. And for, for those problems where it holds, DMRG should work. However, 
then came the result that said, hey, here's an example of a problem where the area law holds, but finding the solution is hard. So that sort of gives us, you know, that, that says this is sort of an artificial dividing line because here's something that lies over here for which we, we're pretty sure you're not going to be able to do this. So it's a 1D system. 1D system. And it satisfies the area law, not because of the gap, evidently. I mean, it sort of it was built up. It was it was a constructed example. So, that's it. so could Hastings prove actually uh, uh, imply something stronger than the error law, so that uh, the NP harness result would fail? Meaning that why why could, could actually it, <coughs> so for example uh, could one infer from his his the inner working of his proof something I don't, actually I don't stronger? think so. Do you think so? No, I don't think so. Well, sorry, you can follow up. Uh, so is area law equivalent to some statement about uh, how entanglement uh, decrease? <coughs> yeah, it as a proxy for it, you can, um, if it's helpful as a proxy for it, you can sort of say that this picture of a matrix product state that sort of has a, a polynomial size bond dimension, this may be worse rather than better than whatever you were thinking about, but you can sort of say that there's a good approximation using a matrix product state with polynomial bond dimension. But maybe that's not helpful. So, so ask your question. Well, I guess one, one, one point to say is that, so for example, I, I think there are many ways that error can be satisfied. So, for example, if the entanglement is decreasing double exponentially, that satisfy that would make system satisfy the error law, right? So, if, if <coughs> the result actually implies it's decreasing super fast, maybe so, so that would rule out that and be harness result. Yes, yes. Okay. I, I think what, what, what you're getting at is this. So, so. Proving an area law by itself was not sufficient uh, to, to, to get the small matrix product state. You, you know, for that, uh, uh, Hastings had to do it in the proper notion of, uh, you know, he had to get, get it not just using entanglement entropy, but some other form of entropy. But, but this example, you know, what, what it was saying was, not only does it, does it satisfy the area law, but in fact, you have a small matrix product state. Yes. And then you, you just can't find it efficiently. Okay. I guess that's still the, the possibility that if one look into Hastings' proof, maybe there are efficient applications that... Uh, in in fact, we, we, we know it does, we, we know it, well, in some mathematical sense it does, because now we know that there is, you know, it is true that there is a, so, so you could mathematically make it happen. <coughs> okay. Understand sort of intuition for constant gap systems. Are they supposed to be um, physically realistic, or most systems you encounter in practice have a constant gap? So I think there's someone better to. Uh, so my understanding is yes, in many ways, but there's someone in the corner there who's probably Daniel. Do, is there so for for uh, is there a reason that constant gap systems have a physical, uh, more likely physical? The quantum Hall system is gap, right? And it's very physical in the pulp. That's there, one example. That's one example. But is there a reason? And is there a reason to think? Well, all right. So this is a. There are plenty that are not gap. So, yeah. but, they, but they are gap systems. But you don't need to be constantly gap. Like you could have a gap that decays exponentially to a constant with system size. But I think constant gap is a stronger statement. So, so what we mean more bounded by a constant that's more Yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah, it just means <laughs> at least at least this much. Yeah, and physics when the gap is more yeah. over polynomial, physics say there's no gap. Yeah. So, so it would have been enlightening to so there are four four notions. So gap exists, um, area low holds, the range of interaction is small. And there exists a matrix product state. Now, certain implications hold. So, <laughs> in between these four, right, and that's what you were talking about, that in between these four, like for instance, now in 1D, we know that from gap, we know that area low holds. Now, I don't know, for instance, if from area low we can uh, deduce long range that the interaction is long range, I mean, that the long range. Or the other I think way just purely area law does not imply that the interactions aren't long range, right, but so matrix product state would. 
one day it follows, no, or not, no days it follows. And then finally, the, the product state assumption, which one of these other three does it imply? So, so there are these four things, and just, I mean, it just would be clarifying to see what the implications are. But See, so also here it seems like you would want to produce an example that was harder than NP in order to cross out that diagram, right? So the first statement says they're in NP. You can be NP hard and in NP, of course. But but NP hard shouldn't have an algorithm that solves them, right? That's true. So density matrix normalization group is a polynomial time algorithm. And then back to Mario. <laughs> I'm not sure I can do this on the fly in terms of and get it accurate. Uh, anybody else want to offer anything up for the moment? I mean, I can say that from my point of view, uh, when I think area law, I really am thinking of it as approximatable by a matrix product state, regardless of whether that's in fact the exact statement that area law as formulated in terms of entanglement entropy say, which which I think is not equ it's not equivalent, but sort of. Way. Well, area law just says the entropy is low, so you can certainly have, you know, one bit of entropy can be perfect correlations of that one bit. So, you know, and from if you, just an area law does not mean that correlations are small. So I think it's um, the implication goes in the other direction. Mm -hmm. Or maybe no direction. Uh, no, it, it is known that if the correlations are exponentially decaying. It, at least in one D, that implies an area law. Um, in one D, at least we understand that. Two uh -huh. D, we just don't know yet. Don't know much. Okay. All right. I should I should move on because. <coughs> okay. So I think you've met my challenge quite well, quite well. <laughs> I shouldn't really be pushing you to do anything different. Um, okay. So so um, essentially. I, Perhaps this is revisionist history, but but at least the way I see it is this is sort of at the, about about the time that I started thinking about this problem, and um, Mesh maybe have a different account, but but the account that I remember is something along the lines of I think actually maybe even it was Itai who sort of sort of took a look at Hastings' result and said this is really this is where we should be spending some time, and um, it's a it's a it's a five page paper, right? So I don't know if other people encounter this, but you know. I think five page paper, I can handle this, right? So I went at this thing for a long time and with really minimal success in terms of gaining any kind of intuition. I could sort of follow the steps, but really nothing, and would put it down and would start to think about it, say, well, maybe I can just prove it some other way, and eventually would sort of get discouraged and come back to this idea of like, it's only five pages. Come on, how hard could this be? So I went back and forth with this and sort of eventually uh, sort of without necessarily thinking of this, there's um, so this is a, you know if there's a problem you can't solve, there's, there's an easier problem problem that you you also can't find, solve and you should find it. And Polly is also quoted with with changing that can't to can, so it's not a clear where you go, but you sort of keep going down and hopefully eventually you find something and then kind of go back up. So all right, so that's my motivation for saying, hey, look, let's let's take a look at. Um, Frustrating, fr frustration-free commuting case. Okay, so what am I going to ask for now? I'm going to ask for um, the Hamiltonians. Uh, so frustration-free means that that the ground state actually is going to satisfy each of the each of the pieces separately. So another way to say that is that the actual uh, lowest eigenvector is going to be zero. And I'm going to assume that the the sorry, I'm going to assume that the local terms are projections. And not only that, I'm going to assume that they commute. And as was pointed out uh, sort of earlier, that sort of is reminiscent of the classical case, but I'm not going to assume they're diagonal. I'm just going to assume that they commute. So it's a little more. All right. And so here's it. So, so this is, so I'm, I'm explaining this, and you should probably ask questions about this, because this gives intuition for, for what's coming next, OK? Um, so if you have a bunch of projections that commute, and you're adding them up, and you want the, the one with lowest energy. Start by taking each projection and, and flipping it. Take one minus it. Right? So now that gives highest energy to it's sort of highest energy or it projects into the space 
that includes the ground space. Right? The range is it includes the ground space. And now you can multiply all these guys together. Just take each of those 1 minus those projections and multiply them all together. Now normally you just get some strange operator and the, and the, and the order that you multiplied would matter. But in the commuting case, the order doesn't matter. So you can multiply them all together. And if you think about it a little bit, if you take a bunch of projections that you know commute, and you multiply them all together, you end up with a projection. And what do you end up with the projection of? You end up with the projection onto the only thing that satisfies all the individual pieces, which is the ground state. So just by taking all these projections and multiplying them together, you get a projection onto the ground state, which means that I can start with any state, apply this projection, and I have, it, I have the ground state. Or I have a scaled multiple of the ground state. As long as the thing I started with wasn't orthogonal. Right? And so that's what you can do in, in the frustrating free commuting case. And what do you end up with? You end up with exactly a projection onto the ground state. And because the projection just looks like a product of things, and those things are all little local pieces, um, the, the complexity of it is pretty small. I still haven't said what complexity is, but it's pretty small. Um, and so, and that's in fact, if you, once you do that, you can prove an area law for this particular case. Right? Now, of course, in general, that's not the case. They're not going to commute, right? stuff like that. But it gives you an idea of what you want, and here's what you want. Right? How do you generalize this idea? And the notion of an approximate ground state projection. And this is the thing that sort of drives all the results that come up next. Right? And so what do I want out of an approximate ground state projection? Well, the first thing that I want is that it almost projects onto the ground space. And so what is a ground state? So what does that mean? Right? It means that it keeps the ground state fixed while smushing the perpendicular space. Right? So whatever norm you have in the perpendicular space, reduce it. A projection would reduce it all to zero. But here we're just going to reduce it. And the other thing you want, because we had it up there, is it's not too complex. Right? It's not too complex because we need that to sort of eventually say that the ground state is not too complex. And with this idea and a lot of work, right? Okay, um, and you can construct different approximate ground state projections with different properties and trade-offs of complexity and um, in different things. Uh, but complexity and the amount that it shrinks things down and locality. But two, two results came out of this. The first was a different proof of the 1D area law that exponentially improved the parameters. Um, so it was sort of a fundamentally different proof. It improved the parameters from Hastings' result exponentially, so much so that if you're trying to sort of now generalize that to two dimensions, you're right at the cusp of saying something interesting for two dimensions. So any improvement on these, <coughs> on these constants will get you a subvolume law. Of, um, and it also uh, provided a much better matrix product state. So which parameters are <coughs> the parameters of the amount of entanglement? So there's a constant associated to the entanglement that depends on a bunch of things, including the gap and uh, the dimension of the individual particle space. And it's such that that constant, if you tried to scale that up to a 2D thing, so it ends up being just at the, at the point of, if you do sort of what would be the natural thing to try to scale this up to a two-dimensional thing by doing this. Is that? Yeah. Okay. And it also said that the matrix product state, the bond dimension on it is actually sublinear, which was small enough so that you actually got a sub-exponential time algorithm for finding solutions. So that was sort of the first sign for which maybe you could actually, uh, <laughs> Actually, that, that in fact, gap systems might have an alg provable algorithm that was, you know, we already had a sub-exponential time thing, so maybe there's more. And sure enough, after some other work, um, it resulted in a polynomial time now for finding solutions to gapped 1D systems. Right? And so this sort of represents kind of a closure of that sort of picture because DMRG, this is not, this algorithm is not what DMRG does. But surely there are connections between them. But it also says, hey, look, this, this, this whole program is doable. These types of problems for gap systems, this can be done. <coughs> and so it sort of puts things in a little bit of an alignment. And here's the picture that you ha end up having, which is that the dichotomy is not between area laws, but the dichotomy is where AGSPs exist. Because they are the driving force for both simulation results and area laws. <clears throat> and there are others for which area laws hold, but for which you can't get at them in terms of simulation. Okay. 
So, okay. So let me say sort of just a little more about the consequences of these things, right? So I already said the exponential improvement of the constants, which among other things implies that you're just at the cusp of saying something for 2D. You've got an algorithm for 1D. Gives you a definite sense of what's going on, and it gives you some tools for attacking the 2D. And I'm feeling like I'm running low on time, but I want to, um, well, I want to give some sense of something about how these guys work. So um, let me let me show you how the AGSP sort of the the idea of the AGSP in terms of um, how it sort of helps you with an area law. And so for the area law, here's 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 the general prescription. You've got sort of two pieces to it. The first is find some non-complicated state with a some sort of reasonable angle with the ground state. So if you pretend this is the ground state, right, or I guess I've got it here. Here's the ground state. First, find something that's pretty not complex, right, that has some non-trivial angle with the ground state. And now, if you have an AGSP as well, you can apply it. And what does it do? And if you apply it a bunch of times, it's going to rapidly move what you have uh, close to the ground state. And since the original guy that you started with wasn't too complex, right, and there you've got some calibration on the complexity of the AGSP, right, by the time you're done, because it's a rapidly moving process, you've, you're, you can bound the complexity. And it turns out, so, so we can sort of see very clearly the role of the AGSP in the second thing, but it turns out that that to get the, the difficult thing is this. The difficult thing is finding or showing that there exists um, a relatively non-complex state that has any non-trivial inner product with the ground state. Not, you know, sort of a random one will have exponentially small, but if you want to get anything up to sort of one over poly small, that's, there's, that's the hard part of the problem. And let's see, so now I have to do triage in one minute. <laughs> I'm going to skip this. Um, I'm just going to give you a sense of the, um, a more precise sense of what the AGSPs are in terms of the parameters. Um, so an, remember, an approximate ground state projection has the, have two parameters associated to it. One is how well does it shrink things towards the ground state, how fast it does that. And that's depicted here as a sort of picture where the eigenvalue associated to the ground state is one, and all the eigenvalues associated to everything else are below some parameter delta, which sort of means it shrinks it, cuts it by delta each time. So we call that this sort of shrinking parameter. And the second is a level of complexity, um, which I wish I had time to talk about. But it's just it's the simplest that you can imagine. It's, uh, it's the amount of a linear combination of amount of simple tensor products that you need to describe the, uh, the operator. So if, if a simple thing would just be um, the product of, of a term on the left side acting on the left and a term acting on the right. And now we can sort of ask for linear combinations of those and ask for the number of, line, the number of terms in that linear combination to be small. And that's, that's the complexity that we're talking about. That's d. And it turns out that when you can, if you can construct such a thing for which d times delta is less than 1, then you get an area law. And so the whole, the whole name of the game is to, to do this. And that's true in any dimensions, if you can get this to work out. And the way uh, d has units one over energy. What's that? D has units one over energy. D has no d or, or d is an integer, right? Uh, as much as it can be as big as so. Uh, d is the number of terms. It's just the number of terms that you can. <coughs> the Schmidt rank. The Schmidt rank. Yeah. Well, for op for the operators, that's a little bit. But delta yeah. has units. No, I don't. delta. Delta has, yeah, so we've normalized the Hamiltonian, the individual terms of the Hamiltonians to have norm one, and so oh, the deltas. Okay, and so, uh, let's see. Can I go a few minutes over? What do you, what do you think? What would, how do five, I? Five minutes? I think five minutes should do for getting, yeah. Okay. Um, so the, there's nothing worse than a talk that goes over when you're expecting it not to, so I apologize for it. Um, but anyway, um, let me just tell you how uh, this idea of d delta being less than a half would sort of get you, what is, what is the hard part? It's getting a state with a non-trivial overlap with the ground state. And, and the idea is very simple and intuitive, so I want to give it to you because it's sort of something you can take away. And the idea is the following. Start with an, unentangled, uh, a, a very, an unentangled state. 
right? sort of something that's very simple. And uh, it has some inner product, but pro probably much sm too small than what you want. Right? It's sort of almost orthogonal. But now, but hit it with the AGSP. Right? What does that do? That moves it closer. But what does it do to it? It also makes it more complex. Right? So how much closer does it move it? Move it? it sort of in increases its inner product by a factor of one over delta. Right? But now it's 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 describable. It, it's it's sort of <coughs> instead of being one term, it's now d terms. Right? That's what the that's what acting by k has done. It's made the new state is a sum of d simple terms. Well, okay. It's d simple terms, so at least one of those terms should have inner product uh, ha that has increased by not a factor of one over delta, but one over d times that. Right? So at least pick out the one term for whose inner product is now increased by the factor of one over delta times one over d, because they're only d terms. Okay. Well, so so what you end up with, right, is you pick out the one with the best overlap. But because d delta is a half. You've now increased the overlap by, you're now back to where you were before, a, a simple state, <coughs> right? but now your overlap has doubled. So you just kind of keep doing this until, you know, this was really an approximation for what's going on, and it turns out that once you're close enough, this approximation starts to not be, it's not, not be as good. But while you're, while you're strictly orthogonal, the factor really is a factor of 1 over delta. So you can just sort of argue that, hey, I could have kept doing this. And so in the end, I would have ended up with a state. And what I end up with a state is that it's some state that has uh, overlap about 1 over, one over d. And, and from there, you're, you're, you've got the first step. And so now you apply any AGSP to kind of do the rest. So when you do one step of this, then you, again, you get into an unentangled state, right? Yeah. So you are always stepping on unentangled state. Yeah. However, States. However, you know that the solution is an entangled state. Yeah. But so this so is. I guess that's why you get stuck, no, somewhere. Yeah. And remember, it, we're trying to do step one of this. We're trying to end up with a, a very simple state that has a reasonable inner product, but not necessarily that close. And then, at, you know, that argument works for a while, and so we can get something somewhere. At, at, at which point, it stops working because we're close enough so that that approximation that you're actually increasing by one over delta isn't quite right. But when entangled states don't work anymore. Like then you hit close. it. Then you start to increase the complexity. But the, now, because you're close enough, it's a rapid convergence to the ground state. So you don't have to do it for very long. So you've started with an entangled thing. And then you do. You hit it, and and it's in fact that's you know. Well, okay, that's probably where I should stop. So let me see if there's anything. Um, I was. I, I realized I didn't get to talk about the algorithm at all. But there's a. You can find that by talking to me separately. And so here, here's, here's just, let me just do the concluding slide, right? So, so this, this approximate ground state projection has these quite dramatic effects, right? Both on simulation and structure uh, in 1D. And there's reason to think that this is a new tool. Um, and the constructions that are used are kind of in, are very interesting in terms of they weren't so easy to come by and seem to be rather subtle. And so in terms of things that I want to, would hope for coming out of this semester, um, definitely some sort of progress, or just sort of these are the questions that I would like to think about. Um, 2D area law, for sure. A more local 1D algorithm. The algorithm right now sort of has to sort of take into account everything. Um, it sort of sweeps across the state. It would be nice if somehow it could be modular and work on pieces of the state independently. I think that's a sort of an attractive uh, thing, and I have some ideas about that. Um, there's this question of, with, with the gaps that we haven't really, um, we've really been specializing to the place where there's a unique ground state, a gap. And I think there are a lot of interesting questions um, when, the, when there's not a unique ground state. And surprisingly, it doesn't, seems like some more ideas are going to be needed. I, I've, Having sort of felt like I understood something, that once I start thinking about those things, I don't feel like I've understood very much at all. It's sort of kind of embarrassingly how many silly questions I don't know the answer to. Um, and then uh, hopefully there's some different questions in these methods. So thanks. Questions? Do we know anything about the excitedness, say, Laura?
energy. Yeah, so for thermal. Not, not thermal oh, just like low energy. Yeah. Low energy, no. No. Like, so you say, well, maybe not the ground state, but like a few energies. I don't think so. You said that there were reasons to believe that uh, <coughs> it's a good time to So I think the reasons are that you've got, so yeah, so, so the reasons are one is sort of this progress on the 1D and the sort of this idea is of these approximate ground state projections and, and some of the other ideas in, in 1D that are sort of showing up. I think the others is because of the set of people who are accumulated right now right here, which is sort of this kind of, um, I think there's sort of some, there's some, I, I, it's my understanding that physicists have a set of intuitions that I really do not have. Um, and um, I, th I think there's some cross talk that would really be helpful to have at this point in terms of, yeah, I just think it's just sort of a, it's a good time. So sort of similar to similar to your question. Um, no, 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 no. It's similar, similar. Um, so these are good questions to ask, I, and I don't know the answer uh, right off the top of my head. And um, it's unclear for the moment. I mean, these are really quite recent in terms of thinking. So it's unclear at the moment whether there are real barriers or not. Um, but they're definitely good questions. The same sort of question. I mean, if you start talking about higher dimensional. You know the next highest energy. You know, perhaps a simpler version of that question would be: suppose the two lowest energies are the same, right? Which is sort of gets to a two-dimensional ground space, and so now. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's thank Zeph again.